A shattering thriller from the director of The Sixth Sense, an homage to cinema's master of suspense and a code-breaking character from history comes to the stage here in Paris. That's all coming up in today's show. We're starting with a filmmaker known for keeping us on the edge of our seats. M. Night Shyamalan has just released the final film of his unbreakable franchise, Glass. In it, Sarah Paulson of American Horror Story fame plays a psychologist studying patients who believe they're superheroes. The patients are played by some of the director's regular collaborators, Bruce Willis, James McAvoy and Samuel L. Jackson. France 24's Renaud Lefort went to meet the stars at the premiere here in Paris. Superheroes exist only in their own minds. That is the question. My name is Dr. Ellie Staple, and I'm a psychiatrist. My work concerns a particular type of delusion of grandeur. I specialize in those individuals who believe they are superheroes. <laughs> Good for you. Every scene in Glass is about doubt and belief and whether, whether there's something great inside us or whether there's a, um, there's a, there's a different kind of truth out there. So who, who, what's the reality? Billions will die. Forget Marvel's special effects and Aquaman's watery kingdom. Here, all the fighting is fist to fist. James McAvoy plays a character split between multiple personalities. <laughs> He describes the behind-the-scenes realities of a fight scene with Bruce yeah, Willis. Friends, it's a feeling. Oh well, he was covered in pipes. He had like a like a camera rig facing his own face, and it was on a big thing, and it involved a lot of pipes and a lot of wires and a lot of metal, um, all covered by his tent, his sort of uh, overseer's poncho, which was great. But it meant that when I was grabbing and holding on to him for maybe two or three minutes at a time, I was getting stabbed by Paul. So that was pretty sore. But, um, you know, it's all part of the fun. Our the award winning Everything Sarah Paulson of American yeah. Horror Story fame is as unpredictable as ever. The light will force a different identity to take over. Por favor, senora. I want my headphones back. The director and writer of The Sixth Sense also uses deleted scenes from Unbreakable in flashbacks, a chance to catch a glimpse of Bruce Willis, 18 years younger. Glass breaks away from your average big-budget Hollywood superhero production, made on a somewhat slimmer $20 million budget. What have you done, Elijah? Next to one of the 20th century's giants of cinema, the master of suspense who created the voyeur filming style, which put the viewer at the heart of the action. The work of Alfred Hitchcock is now being celebrated in a retrospective at Lyon's Institut Lumière. The legendary director was a confirmed Francophile, and his connections here in France helped cement his status as a major player in the industry. Ellen Gainsford tells us more. He's now celebrated as a film world's master of suspense. But Alfred Hitchcock wasn't always recognized as such. Bonjour, je suis Alfred Hitchcock. It was his love for France and his connection with the country that helped bring him international acclaim. His US biographer, Patrick McGilligan, says he was always a Francophile. France and Paris always represented for him fun. Romance, uh, great food, uh, the women uh, in the clubs, the dancers, the singers, uh, and he loved that kind of life. With his wife Alma, the director would sleep and dine at Paris's Plaza Hotel, where his legend still lingers on. Alfred Hitchcock was terrified of fire, so he needed to feel safe to know about if anything ever happened. He could evacuate the building immediately, so he always took a suite on the first floor. In this suite, he would receive friends, actors and journalists. Despite his passion for the country, he only shot two of his over 50 films here. Most famously, To Catch a Thief with Cary Grant and Grace Kelly. Sylvette Baudreau worked on Hitchcock's films as a continuity girl. Her attention to detail pleased the director. 
Look, see how he dedicated it to me. He crossed out director Alfred Hitchcock and wrote Sylvette Baudreau. Cary Grant also signed it for me. Baudreau also has a letter from French cinema legend François Truffaut, the new wave director who helped cement Hitchcock's status. With the publication of a book of interviews he conducted with the director, it's thanks to Truffaut that Hitchcock gained recognition as a master of cinema. He started the book with Hitchcock in 1962. It then took a few years for him to publish it. That was in 1967. He spent five years on what he called the Hitch book. And in 1968, a year after the book came out, Hitchcock was finally recognized internationally for his talent. The world of cinema may have taken a while to recognize Hitchcock's genius, but the public were quick to adore him. We see Alfred Hitchcock. He's kindly requesting to post the cinema Nipamo. We're taking a look now at a theatrical production which revisits the life of a troubled genius, Alan Turing. The British mathematician and computer scientist developed some of the code-breaking technology which changed the course of the Second World War, notably thanks to a special machine. Emerald Maxwell has the story. Enigma, a code used by the Germans during the Second World War. Brilliant mathematician Alan Turing is given the job of cracking the complex code. He'll get there by creating his own machine. The play tells a tale of this incredible discovery, but also of the life of the man behind it. Benoit Solès wrote and stars in the play. It's been a pet project of his for a decade. Turing's invention heralded the modern computer. He was also instrumental in the battle against Enigma, so he helped change the course of the Battle of the Atlantic and thus the course of the Second World War. So I wanted to pay homage to him and I wanted more people to know his story, but also I just had this feeling that he'd make a good character on stage. It took the real Turing just two years to decrypt the German army's supposedly unbreakable code. The discovery meant the Allies could track and destroy German submarines, thus precipitating the end of the war. Today, Turing's machine is exhibited at Bletchley Park in England, where he invented it. It's called the bomb, and it's an absolutely enormous iron thing. It was mechanic, not electronic, so it used electricity, but just rotors. On top of his scientific discoveries, the play also explores Alan Turing's tragic fate, the victim of homophobia in an intolerant and Puritan Britain. He escaped prison by agreeing to chemical castration in 1952. Two years later, he took his own life, eating an apple laced with cyanide. It was only in 2013 that Alan Turing was posthumously pardoned and rightfully recognised as a war hero. It's not the first thing you'd expect to see while going about your shopping, but visitors to the Bon Marché department store here in Paris are getting a dose of contemporary art with their purchases at the moment. Simone is a gigantic, tentacular installation created by Joanna Vasconcelos. The piece is one of her Valkyries, a series of sculptures depicting mythical goddesses. The Portuguese artist returns to the French capital after being the first female artist invited to exhibit her work at the Chateau de Versailles in 2012, where her craftsmanship and innovative use of traditional Portuguese motives evokes the female experience, especially in the domestic sphere. We went along to the Bon Marché to hear what some of the visitors thought of this latest show. It's a bit of an oxymoron. There's lightness, yet denseness filling the space. It's on one hand decorative, but it also works in a space like the Bon Marché. It's gigantic. The crochet and fringe detail is incredible. 
to have these little details on such a large work of art is so unexpected. It's a real performance. We're wrapping up the programme with some rock music with a political bent. The Killers have teamed up with director Spike Lee on their latest video for a track entitled Land of the Free. Inspired by Donald Trump's plans to build a wall between the United States and Mexico, the song's a sharp critique of the American president's immigration policy. And when it comes to imagery, Spike Lee has zoomed in on the plight of migrant families trying to make that journey across the border. We'll leave you with a preview. Do remember you can get more arts and culture on our website and you can keep up with us on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this.